DigitalJamSessions.com Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam Session. Today we are led by a guest host. DigitalJamSessions.com Hi, this is uh, Oscar Clark and I'm uh, standing in as a guest host for Digital Jam on behalf of Tony Led. And today I've got some amazing guests who are going to help talk to me about a topic dear to my heart, which is the role of personality in games and on- online. And to get us started, what I'm going to do is introduce my lovely guests. I'm going to kick off with uh, Natalie Griffith. Natalie is an industry veteran, compulsive empowerer, passionate games and tech marketer, so she says, and also the owner of Identity Spark. She also does a lot of mentoring. She does so much stuff. I think you do scouts as well, don't you, Natalie? I do, yes. I do want to scout too as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would use the usual joke about where do you get tired, but you tell us a bit more about stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I have a DeLorean parked in the garage. It's all good. Yeah, so, so yeah, I've been in the games industry 28 years this year. I started life as a graphic designer, though I used to work on um, like games packaging and subscription uh, magazines and things. Um, so I worked for Codemasters for a few years in the early 90s. And then I became a journalist. I was the editor of the official Nintendo magazine for five years. And then I made the kind of more common these days leap from journalism into PR marketing. And I established the PR team at Blitz Game Studios, which was one of the UK's sort of longest running independent game studios at that point. And I was there about 12 years. And for the last five years, I have been running my own agency, focusing on branding and marketing and PR for indies and big studios and tech startups. And yeah, I just love it. It keeps changing. So you're just fresh in the industry, obviously. <laughs> Tara, Tara. So uh, here we have Tara Masama, who's, again, described herself as a hand-waving ideas person, reluctant project manager, consultant and founder of Mischief Games, making things and helping developers learn while making them. Tara, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, wow. How do I, you know, follow up from that? I've only been in the industry for 14 years, which I thought was forever. Yeah, I've been, you know, worked in design and production at various studios, like uh, from the big ones like EA and Microsoft to smaller indie startups, you know, over the years. And uh, currently I'm building Mischief Games, which is a development studio that I'm trying to put high value on studio culture and diversity and uh, being a great place to work rather than the end product necessarily. So... It's my big dream. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, just so we show we're all a bunch of oldies, we've got Angelo, Angelo Bond, who's an old school creative person, senior producer for Play Snack, pushing games out to the market. Hopefully people will enjoy you, say. <laughs> You've done a lot more, lot more stuff in the past. That's always the aim, right, Oscar? That's always the aim. You know, it's a of industry. And in the end, you know, if you make a game that people don't enjoy, then you didn't, you know, per se, it's not that you did do a, a bad job, but, you know, obviously... You know, you would like to be not just in the charts because people buy your game, but also be in the charts because of people enjoy playing what you do. Absolutely, absolutely. But you've done you've done lots of historical stuff too, haven't you? So some people will have heard. Yeah, of. I don't. I don't want to tip it, my my predecessors. Um, I, I I started somewhere in '85, summer '85. Some of the companies I worked for uh, during the many years: Domark, Idol, Boss Virgin, SquareSoft, Sony. After Sony, we decided to do our own stuff, so I ran a small indie studio called Magic Lamp from uh, Cambridge. After many years of that, we said, okay, the market is changing. It went from AAA more to the mobile industry, and that's something that we said, okay, do we want to continue that? Do we, you know, do we not, basically? Somehow, I got tangled into uh, Game of Thrones. They needed some help abroad, so basically, um, I went to Germany. I moved to Germany with my entire family. And then after that, I ended up right now where I am as a senior producer at PlaySnack, where we do VR games. VR games, that sounds like appropriate for this podcast, definitely. Uh, Yeah. What we wanted to talk about is this role of personality. And there's so many different ways to take it. But I suppose one of the things that really showed me what games can do in terms of helping me understand a role, you know, the, the effect that the input from either VR or games or, or just storytelling in general can do, was a, a moment in the VR version of Batman. Uh, there's a, a Batman game where you get to be Bruce Wayne whilst his parents are shot. And this is something that in comic books we've dealt with all the time, but it was the first time I actually felt what it was like to be this young kid and the proportionate size of the world was was huge. And I've never felt... You know, it disempowered in a game before most most games you kind of feel like you're empowered you're the hero etc it's the first time i really felt vulnerable inside a game uh, and i was wondering if you guys had any moments like that where you you had this kind of profound experience which put you out of your normal context 
through either a game or an online experience. Probably be the first time I played that Dragon Cancer. Mm. I played just the, the demo that like, it's Ryan, wasn't it, the developer that, that had uh, developed, and I hadn't heard anything about it before that point. I was just going around looking at some of the games on the expo and say, "Oh yeah, do you want to have a go?" And it's like, "Yeah, okay, cool." He gave me very, very high level idea of what it was about, and I was I was properly, properly blown away and properly, you know, upset and disempowered from a, I guess, as a parent, the sort of the frustration. Explain the game for the listeners. Sorry, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it was um, a game that came out, indie game that came out oh, probably a couple of years ago now, and it was written by, I think it was a husband and wife team of a young lad who was only, oh gosh, still a baby, I think, um, when um, he was with cancer. And they basically, as part of their own therapy, I guess, as well, and to sort of celebrate his life, they they created a game that was an experience of kind of being in the hospital room, dealing with an upset child, not knowing how to comfort them, trying different things to comfort them, and that kind of helplessness of not being able to do anything for your child in a, in a desperate situation like that. And and I've never, yeah, I, I genuinely never, you know, I, I'm very passionate about the the sort of impact that games can have and kind of positive messaging and that kind of thing. But I don't think I ever expected to have such a such a deep seated emotional reaction to something as I did with that. And it was just a two or three minute experience. You're in a in a hospital room, the baby's crying, that you're you know, you're trying to comfort them. And you can kind of give them I think you can give them a drink and you can try different things and, and and there's like this sort of narrative running in the background, like a um it's almost like a sort of a voiceover of the the head of the main character that's kind of trying to reassure that sort of pleading tone in the voice of trying to trying to get the get the kid to calm down and, and it's just yeah i mean it would have been it would have been an emotional challenging experience anyway but then it's even more heartbreaking because you realize that it's it's a real thing so i mean that that's probably one of the occasions that will probably, probably the standout occasion for me when i've kind of realized the power of of literally just playing and almost just watching actually there's very little you do in it yeah, it's a, it's a it's hard to call it a game at some point, so isn't it? It's, yes. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it just uses all the technology, and it, it is an incredible piece of work. I, I, and I, I have to mm-hmm. confess that although I own it, I actually bought it. I can't quite bring myself to play it because I know how emotional it's going to be. Tara, what about yourself? So mine's a little weird. I remember having this distinctly profound experience when I played. You're going to laugh at this. Call of Duty: Modern Warfare, the <laughs> single player. <laughs> Yeah, but it, I remember it was like ages ago, but it still like haunts me to this day because I remember there was and spoiler alert, you know, for everyone, I'm going to tell you what happens in the game in a single player. There was this one mission where I think you were flying, you know, I don't know the technical terms, but this helicopter, and it crashes, and you're you as the pilot, and I think the pilot was female. I couldn't even remember, but there was literally nothing you could do to save yourself or anybody else around you, yeah. and it was just this feeling of impending doom, and I sort of it made me empathize with or i think to some extent people in these situations and i was just really jarred by this feeling of in you know this inevitable death that was coming my way and this sadness and there's just just this countdown happening to that and and then i had there was another mission where where you had to um you're in the bomber and you had to use their you know really um scratchy scrambled ui to decide where you were going to drop bombs and i just remember it being really jarring failing mission distinguish between what was an actual target and what were civilians for example like it made me think you know what about what about people in these situations like how are you supposed to live with that you know because you don't get to just restart the level you ha- you know in real life it's just terrifying it's terrifying exactly and it builds up all of that kind of you know the reality it gives i suppose this kind of gives you a safe space to to experience those, you know, stark realities, I'm guessing. Angela, what about for yourself? What, what would you say was an example of the kind of moment that really kind of profoundly affected you? Uh, the thing is primarily, I mean, I'm totally a different kind of gamer, I think. You know, I'm, I'm really like a Nintendo fanboy. So in that respect, Nintendo does not have really those deep emotional attachments and stuff like that. However, when I started looking into VR a few years ago, I actually downloaded a demo of Blade Runner. Mm. Now, Blade Runner put you in, you know, obviously in the skin of, of a, being a Blade Runner, basically. The immersiveness uh, it gave you as a as a player, being set in the VR world, makes it so more, not realistic, but so more attached within 
within that 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 moment and within the world that they that the you know the creators put you in. However, like emotional, I think it's it's everything. It's like the feel. It's like your movement. It's like the interactiveness within the VR field that really kind of blew me away how immersive this was. And I, I can't really give you um, a good example of what this is, but the thing is, if you have played VR games before, or even you know VR apps basically that are out there, it, it goes really deep. It, it really does. I mean, to give an example, and, 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 and this is not just really um, emotional state or stuff like that, but we just released a game in VR, and it's a simple shooter. Having said that, after 15 minutes of narrative and playing, it's really tough. I mean, I, I really sweat. It's like, whoa, that's an experience that you that I'd never experienced before. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, what I think an example of an experience I've had in VR like that was most profound with the the demo for Portal. There's a there's a Portal VR experience. I think it was on the Vive. Yes, that's right. And I knew it was coming out. I was told there's going to be this robot. It's going to come into the room and you're going to feel yourself physically move backwards. And I was told that, and apparently everybody does. But because I knew this was happening, I deliberately forced myself into this virtual space occupied by this robot. And it was really hard to do because every sense in you says there's something there. Yeah. Even though it's physically not there. You, every sense says it does. So the, that sort of level of a kind of immersion, which is completely profoundly different in a VR experience, even more so than I think AR, is absolutely something kind of really effective. But it makes me think, you know, more generally. I mean, there's there are so many different ways where this can work well, and so many different ways this can work badly. And what's in particularly in my mind is, you know, if we are seeing people who don't pay attention to the impact, you know, if you're a developer that doesn't pay attention to the impact of these kind of immersive worlds. Not only are they missing out on a potential, you know, amazing experience, but I think they, they could be even, you know, creating false experiences, you know, or false expectations. Have you guys ever seen anything that kind of makes you think, yeah, they haven't quite got it yet? There's quite a few games out there that they haven't got it quite yet, right? And and this all relates to like, you know, simple things like motion sickness or you know believability or all, all that kind of stuff, right? Hmm. Motion sickness being one of probably one of the most profound things that you should prevent as a developer because it's so easy to say, okay, this does work, this does not work, basically. And it might work for one person, it might not work for, for another person, but that's that's really a challenge. Hmm. So, I mean, the other thing in my mind, though, is um, it's also a case of, you know, thinking about back to personality. We do see that there's something about being in a virtual world or be, even being in an online context where people behave differently than they would in their normal daily lives, sometimes positively, but more often than not, negatively. Now, I mean, there's a psychological principle about that, because if we're in a protected you know, environment where we don't where we feel we're anonymous, a lot of the social norms go away. But have we seen anyone using, has anyone seen anything using these, this principle of anonymized experience, as in either online or, or in-game, that's been used for a positive experience? Tara, do you have any kind of any ideas of areas where this idea of being within a world can be a positive experience? I'm trying to think of what what I am playing around with this big idea that I haven't quite developed yet, but maybe you guys can help me with this because I think one of the positive things is we've all grown up, you know, empathizing and playing through these stories, and being other people, you know, through throughout all of our game experience. And does that has that had an effect on our generation and the generations to come on how we identify and how we explore, perceive the world in a normal day-to-day -day basis, you know, and I'm wondering if that's, we've seen so much transition and change in the world today. Is that part of the reason why? Does that make sense? No, absolutely. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense, particularly because... I know, I was just going to say that I kind of think, I think that works, that works in both ways as well. I think there's, depending on your kind of core personality to start with, I guess, some people having the opportunity to quotes experience other people's experiences by being other characters can be kind of quite liberating and allow them to be more you know more free with their own choices i guess but then the flip of that is true as well if you know if you're kind of somebody that is 
you, you know, you can end up only living your life in, in anonymous virtual kind of, <laughs> I don't mean kind of like, you know, ready player one kind of thing. I just mean in terms of like conducting yourself and you actually then, it then becomes potentially harder for you to be yourself. So I think it can go either way, just depending on, you know, the, the personality and, and your, the experiences that you bring to it in the first place. I mean, it does make, make me think about the echo chamber problem, particularly in the online space where we, where we surround ourselves with experiences that we want that we appreciate so whenever we see something that has a different perspective we, it feels jarring and therefore there's an easy reaction against it even if it's you know even if it's just not true that you know whatever whatever thing whatever prejudice we have whatever experience we have because we've just been so isolated we're just not used to it and therefore the new seems scary yeah i think i think that's true and i think you know we kind of see that even outside the games you know we in, in politics and stuff and over the last two or three years have shown that hugely the the power of the kind of social media echo chamber that you tend to kind of gravitate towards the things that you agree with and the people that you support and and even if you're trying to be open-minded and liberal and getting all opinions inevitably your your little kind of your funnel of information is getting tighter and tighter i think tara you you were trying to get to this sort of point as well which is you know, this is this is a double-edged sword. It's a tool, isn't it? it you, know, you know, the fact that we know that being in an environment that is not your your daily routine uh, frees you to make choices that you wouldn't make for yourself. But it also presumably makes freedom for the artist or the, the the developer to provoke different emotions and to steer us into different experiences. Mm. And I, guess, I think we're in this really interesting space right now because I've been toying around with this idea that I want to create like experiences where it forces, say, somebody out of their comfort zone in a really sort of subtle way. Like, imagine if we were, with all this fake news that's going on and how things are being fed to us through our feeds and everything. Imagine if you had a game where you had to actually, like, run a fake news company and, you know, your analytics and stuff like that and be pumping out all of this live data to people of opposing beliefs and getting that whole perspective on what other people are hearing and how you're manufacturing that. I think there's really an interesting opportunity to explore all that. Mm. It's like a, a kind of taking an idea like the game Papers, Please, where you're basically following through rules and regulations in order to pass people through a effectively, effectively a customs gate, and you work out as the rules change that there's changes in the society, and you're now starting to do things which you may not agree with. And how do you re deal with that? Because the point of the game is that you do follow the rules. So, yeah, I think there's whole, whole areas. And even, actually, actually, you mentioned the physical side of things as well. I think that plays a part to a certain extent because, you know, if you are being very active, you know, in these kind of experiences, particularly because in VR and, and to a certain extent AR, particularly around location, you can be very active. There's a kind of adrenaline response and endorphin response from the physical exercise that you're you're getting, combined with the the kind of narrative element. Do you think that's a part of it as well? Oh me, yes, I do. I think it's going to be really interesting to see because because there's so many different things are firing. How and the, the activity? How do people then change how they interact with things? How their representation of themselves? Is it more authentic then? Do they not? then want to violate all of these, you know, traditions or manners that we have or social values that we have, you know, in the real world, does that translate because of this physical presence mm. into these games? Um, no, exactly, exactly. Andrew, do you have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I've been listening quietly. They just wanted to disturb me in the room. But uh, no, absolutely, it's going to be, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there has been a trend, uh, like I was saying before, you know, for the last four to five years, basically, into this field and then that in combination with ar you know where that's adding definitely this definitely definitely has you know an impact yeah and i think it also affects us as developers yeah absolutely. because I, I think you know i mean how for you angelo you know what how how much time is involved in thinking about not just the personality of the player that's going to be playing this game i.e the choices they're likely to make but also what personality you're bringing in because obviously with things like game of thrones you're bringing in you know established characters that are understood either through the television or from the books you know does that affect how you work yeah of course of course you know especially you just mentioned game of thrones i mean there is a you know very wide variation of characters basically one of the very sneaky versus one is very political and how that's an entangled into the game and the experience for players basically and also how do how do the players perceive this right you know uh, 
some some characters are very likable, some characters are very not likable, right? Especially in Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. It's um yeah, I mean it, it it goes pretty deep. It goes pretty deep, I would I would say. Yeah, I think so. And I think there's also kind of the reactions that people have. I mean people can get very, very deeply committed to those experiences. So we, yeah. we, you know, we yeah. can we see people cosplaying in at Comic Cons with game characters all yeah. the time nowadays. In fact almost as almost as commonly as we see them in, in superhero characters, arguably. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm kind of wondering whether this is kind of spilling out into the sort of wider world. I mean and Part of that obviously leads us to the sort of, I suppose, slightly towards what Tara and, and Nat, you two were talking about in terms of, you know, there is a sort of positive and a negative side to this. And, you know, the safety that somebody who's watching an experience, you know, who's participating from a distance can throw in grenades for fun, you know, the trolling aspect of things. Absolutely, yeah. And that's been particularly bad. Is that, is that getting any better? Are, are people dealing with that at all, do we think? I, I think yes, because it's it's brought in the news more often, of course. And, and, and on top of that, as being a parent, to make sure that the next generation is basically kind of protected by, you know, the, the things what's happening right now, of course, because... Like you say, it's questionable, you know, an open world where every, everything is possible, you have the, the good things and the bad things, right? And we are trying to protect the next of kin, basically, from all the bad things, basically, that could potentially happen. Yeah, and, and Nat, are you saying that, because obviously from a kind of PR and marketing point of view, you know, the worst thing that can happen is when somebody starts, you know, some group of, of players start using an environment in a way where they're starting to do bullying and things like that. Are, are yeah. you seeing that happening, Nat? Uh, you know, is that is that happening, or are you fi finding that's becoming a little easier or, or worse? I think it really does still happen. It feels to me as if that has improved over the last couple of years. You know, we kind of hit the zenith of that with some Gamergate stuff. But I think I think you're right, Angelo. About you know, it's getting the mainstream news more, which I think in a way is is a good thing. I mean, it doesn't help the general reputation of the industry when your kind of average tabloid reader thinks that's all the industry is about. But aside from that, when it reaches outside of our industry, I think it's been a little bit more of a wake-up call. But it, yeah. it does feel to me like that has calmed down a little bit, but I'm also kind of conscious of just listening to you just then of thinking back to our previous question of, is that just my echo chamber? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't play, you know, online shooters or, or you know, it's kind of some of the games where that that kind of stuff is more prevalent. So maybe I'm just less exposed to it. And I've not worked on any, any games like that in a year or so. So it, my gut feel is that it improves. But I, th I think you're also right, Tara, about, you know, as our, you know, we're a generation that kind of grew up with this stuff we've had to navigate some of this stuff as it's arrived you know when we all started in the industry all this kind of stuff wasn't even a thing but i think actually it's because of that it's only going to get better eventually because we're raising kids with an awareness of them or hopefully with an awareness of that kind of thing yes we are being cautious we're trying to protect them but well so my kids are 10 and 12 nearly 13 and and so they're at the point where they're kind of you know massively into youtube and following stuff and, and the, the oldest one is is you know tentatively on social media to agree and it's i'm trying to it's that balancing act i think as as parents and i think as creators we need to be aware of this kind of thing as well it's kind of giving them not just protecting them but it's trying to give them access to those environments in a way where they learn how to protect themselves because ultimately that sort of we need to be able to give them the power to make those decisions and not just kind of go oh that's it you're not going on the internet or you're not having social media so i think and i say i think clearly the responsibility of individual families is is you know primarily with parents but i think as creative and as an industry we need to we need to help help parents and schools and and anybody else working with kids help them to teach the kids to have the skills to help themselves one thing I noticed was it's really interesting because everything moves so fast in our industry. And I don't know if you saw the other day, I think Blizzard announced that they're implementing a new system into their Overwatch end of round scoring system where you can like give endorsements to players based on their behavior and encourage them. And I think, yeah, so I think what's interesting is that we've gone from a bit of a shaming culture, like calling people out on Twitter, calling people out, you know, in We've got so much data and so much proof of how, in a way, bad a player you are that we can call people out on that. But we're now changing to more of a rewarding culture. Like instead of shaming people, we're trying to build up people for their good behavior. And it's interesting seeing the shift, I think. So it's been interesting because I've just started playing League of Legends in the last three months. 
you'll know I'm a bit late to the game, but it's still horrible. <laughs> and the best tool that I found is just going, you know, slash mute all, just so that I don't get tilted or anything like that. But I think once we start getting more into teaching people to be nice to each other by rewarding them, yeah, I maybe. Think I, I think it's interesting because I think that anybody kind of doing community management over the last sort of five or six years will know that to do that effectively, you have to set a positive tone at the beginning. You have to empower and encourage the people who are behaving well and reward them and, you know, minimise the impact of the people that are, that are behaving badly. But it's interesting that you say that kind of actually it's only just now that developers are starting to actually, you know, codify that into games and actually, you know, gamify that that rewarding thing so that the rest of the community get, get to see that. Because I've seen that kind of thing happen in forums and, um, you know, out of game um, with very well-run communities where they do... Um, you know, praise and reward. That kind of leads us neatly into the, uh, the cause at the end of these uh, sessions, uh, Tanya asks us all a big question. Normally it's a question about what the, uh, you know, what culturally needs to change. But actually, I think I'm going to do a little twist on that for this. I'm going to ask you guys what you think, you know, the, the games and online experiences can do to help deliver change. Who wants to pick up on that? Yeah, I'll go if you like. So I, I think for me, it's, it's, we can actually help people learn about themselves and about how they conduct themselves. I, I wrote a piece for a um, fanzine thing a few months ago about the power of playing The Sims to give kids a mental health sort of vocabulary toolbox. And my two are usually into The Sims and helping helping them with kind of you know navigating puberty and various other kind of you know mental health issues that all kids go through but don't have a language for. I noticed my youngest in particular was starting to describe how we felt about particular situations by using things that compared to like the UI design in Sims. So it'd be like, oh, you know, my, my frustration's a bit red or, or, or whatever. And, and I think actually and I kind of picked up on that and started communicating with him in that way. And that really helped to open up some dialogue in a way that at his age, he didn't necessarily have the words to use. So, so I think sometimes it's unexpected things where, again, as parents, I've kind of been, I seem to have been talking all the way through this as, as a parent, but I think as parents, it's kind of, you know, we, we should be looking at all sorts of ways that, that games can positively impact our kids' experiences of life and themselves and not just look to protect them from it, but actually look at how we can really take positive things out of it that will help them. Absolutely. Angela, do you have a thought? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's a continuous line. Uh, say, for example, education. I think we should continue doing that more uh you know accurate history for example you know if there's any games out there for example uh the battlefield series right they've been slated on that bad history to actually uh do a better job on that one exercises for example i mean we fit is a very good example on you know a positive spin on how we how we move forward uh, that should continue as well i just bought a, a game for my girls my girl's eighth birthday and um, i bought dance dance from ubisoft 2018 version. I think it's a very healthy exercise. Sociably, she can, you know, obviously compete with uh, her girlfriends. I, I think it's all, all of that. Mm, uh, totally. I think if you look at the praise that Assassin's Creed uh, Origins got for the accuracy of the way that they were building up some of that history. I mean, obviously, it's a game. It's a, it's got you know fantasy elements to it, but you know they went through a lot of detail to try and you know, get right for the period in the in the location in the row around Egypt and so on and so forth. But you know, I'm a huge fan of anything that can bring authentic history, authentic science into games because it reinforces positive and science based thinking. Tara, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um for me it's about I think the idea behind forgiveness and kind of critical thinking as we're players. I think for for a long time it was sort of, and maybe this is a stereotype, like, you know, when I was growing up in schools, the athletes who kind of got the idea that failure was okay because you get up, you dust yourself off, you try again, you think critically about what went wrong and how you can improve without punishing yourself. And I think there was a clear line between those kind of two groups of that kind of thinking. And then going forward, I think games can teach how to think more critically, how to be kind to yourself and to other people when something goes wrong and how, how to improve. So. That's a big one for me. I think that's a great place to end it. So on that note, I'd like to thank my guests. And actually, can I get you all to just tell the uh, listeners the uh, your preferred social media handle of choice? Angelo, do you, what's your what's your social media you use and the uh, handle of choice? <laughs> I don't really use social media that much, to be honest. It's more of, I'm, I'm more of a listener than uh, somebody that's actually posting 
stuff. I mean, that's more for a community manager over here. But if it's for people, I mean, I use Skype, but that's not really social media, is it? <laughs> yeah, but if they wanted to uh, to find out more about you, what what would the? And I mean, I mean, there's 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 some stuff out there. Uh, if if people want to reach out, if they're more more interested, they can. I mean, if they type in Angela Bot, there's I think there's only two in the world at the moment, so it should be fairly easy to find out who I am, where, you know, where I'm from, and on how to contact me, basically, if they are interested in the work that we're doing. Great, Natalie. Yeah, so people are happy to welcome them to reach out to me on Twitter. So I'm NatLG underscore Spark, and you can find out more about me on um, identityspark.net. Cool. But yeah, happy to speak to anybody. Cool, Tara. Yeah, I'm on Twitter as well, Tara ZM. Yeah. Me there. Great. On that note, I'm going to thank you again. And this has been the Digital Jam session. If you enjoy this content, don't forget to subscribe and review and follow us on Twitter at Digital Jam LTD. Thinking of starting your own podcast? Why not speak to the GL Pro UK team? They handle all of our podcasting service needs. Tell them that Digital Jam Session sent you and you'll get 10% off your first order. Find out more at www.glpro.co.uk digitaljamsessions.com